Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Okay, so first of all, heartfelt thanks for um, honouring me and, and blessing me uh, on reaching my 60th birthday. Uh, thanks for the gift. We shall uh, do our little investigating later. <coughs> um, but in all honesty, I don't mean this uh, kind of... Well, I mean this sincerely. You really are the gift. Um, the fact that we have someone to walk this journey with and people who are faithful to us and with us on the journey God has called us to and being who we're supposed to be. So while I appreciate this greatly, I appreciate who you are more and I pray that we'll continue our journey uh, until we get the prize. <coughs> so um, I want to make a contribution into uh, the things we've talked about um, tonight. Again, I think <coughs> there has been a theme and um, I have some things to say about that. In a, in a couple of moments, I want to talk about managing expectations, um, which is interesting after some of the songs and what Beth said. <coughs> and um, um, so... Um, first of all, in the context of that, I, in the journey up to present, we have encountered things that many years ago I knew exactly what to do and how to do it in the context of what I was witnessing and encountering and what was being done and this particular sin and that particular behavior. Uh, that was then and this is now. Um, in one sense now, I am in a sense of... Um, a glorious mess, um, <clears throat> because my encounter with, with grace has been so significant that nothing that seemed obvious before is obvious anymore. So I feel a little bit like Jesus when he encountered people like Zacchaeus and the woman caught in the act of adultery and Matthew the tax collector where the religious society had it buttoned down how he should act and what should be the treatment of those people, but Jesus didn't do that because grace was bigger. So I pray that you'll have the grace to continue to walk with the grace that we are discovering and trying to unfold, even when sometimes what is done, or perhaps more often what is not done, might make you feel uncomfortable. We walk in this wonderful grace together, and we're going from faith to faith and glory to glory. And uh, I would rather be accused in the presence of God of erring on the side of grace than of being guilty of issuing judgment and condemnation where it had not been necessary because grace was bigger. One of the classic verses in the Bible is that where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Now the question is, which sin is he talking about? He's talking about all sin of all kinds, done in all ways, by all people. Grace is bigger than all of that. And we're trying to live in that testimony. Um, the sad thing is, it's making us a lot of friends in the world, but it's making us a lot of enemies in the church. So pray for us that we will be strengthened and uh, able to stand. And as the Bible says, having done all to stand. So, as I wrestled in, in preparation for tonight's talk... Um, I, I was really just didn't know which direction to go. Been on holiday, been relaxing, been really chilled. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, read one book and two halves, because sometimes you know you get halfway through a book and you think I've had enough of that. I'll start this one. So I've read one full book um, by um, N.T. Wright, Tom Wright, who was the Bishop of um, of Durham. Who, incidentally, I will be having lunch with in a few weeks' time up in uh, St. Andrews in. Uh, um, in Lucas, north of Edinburgh. Um, and I read another one, half of one by Dave Tomlinson, who is an Anglican vicar in London, who is just, I love to read what Dave says. And I read another one about this thing called universalism. Um, so with all that stuff going round, I'm wrestling for tonight's talk. And, and uh, so sometimes I have a little wander in the house and, you know, I just said, God, I need to hear a word from you. Um, 
because I had some words from me and I could find some words from my circumstances and experiences. Um, but the most important thing to me was to say, God, I really need a, I need a word, hear a word from you. And uh, into my spirit, almost immediately, um, came the word that I, I hadn't been thinking of nor exposed to. You know, and sometimes you've been watching something and then you think you got a word, but actually you've been exposed to that all week. This has not been on my mind. It's not been anywhere in my experiences. But clear into my spirit came the word expectation. And... Um, that just set my heart and spirit moving, and I think it's right for tonight. I think it's particularly right for some individuals, because God's kind enough to do that. Um, we're told always to manage our expectations. Um, in fact, our expectations, more often than not, are approached with the sense of, of negative, okay? Uh, more in the sense of being careful about our expectations, and uh, so we're told often to manage our expectations. And, and how many have had the phrase, you know, lo you need to lower your expectations on this? Or sometimes, if we're the other way, people say you need to raise your expectations. Um, but that's done mostly according to uh, empty, and I have to use this phrase if you understand what I'm saying, BS statements or circumstantial observations, or trends, or perceived possibilities, or opportunities, or in other words, people's instruction to us about our expectations are not based on faith, they're not based on God, they're based on an assessment of stuff around, and then they say either lower your expectations or raise your expectations, but it's got nothing actually to do with anything other than an observation of the normal. <clears throat> We're often made aware of our unrealistic expectations. Uh, but is there any wisdom and insight to be gleaned from a place of faith in the Christ story on the subject of expectations which drive actually so much of our life? There's a couple of verses in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 10 and verse 12. It says this about Jesus. It says, but this man... After he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And this is the verse that's important. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now that sounds a bit religious. I like the New American Standard for that last verse which says, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. He's perfected you for all time. But the issue is in here, it says that because of his one sacrifice and the success of that sacrifice, because remember, Jesus closed out his message to humanity when he could speak before his crucifixion with the words, it is finished. It worked, it was successful. It says, but from that point, he was expecting his enemies to be made his footstool. So what was he expecting as the fruit of his resurrection? That all his enemies be made his footstool. That's the fruit of his resurrection. Now, we need a little explanation on this. First of all, there are a couple of questions. Um, what does he mean by his enemies? He can't possibly be people, and I, I say that to you briefly and clearly for this reason. When Jesus was on the cross with his crucifiers and accusers around the cross and people hurling insults at him. His words were, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. May I therefore propose to you that those who acted irresponsibly towards Jesus, the Son of God, were not considered by him to be his enemies. May I also propose to you that um, the message of Jesus was heavily weighted by an emphasis of love your enemies, forgive your enemies. So how could he then have enemies that either weren't loved or weren't forgiven, that his whole intent was to do what was in Roman culture at that time, 
which was to bring an enemy in front of you who was from a, a country that you had invaded and you would sit down on your throne and then you would put your feet on their back to humiliate them in the presence of all your society who were now there for the victory celebration. I propose to you that in the light of Jesus' words and message that that was never intended to be people or nations or organizations. But I believe the enemies he talks about are things like shame and undervalue and condemnation and guilt. All these kind of things that we carry, that we hold, that, that diminish our, our, our joy of existence, that diminish our person, that stop us being who we're supposed to be. I propose to you that they are the enemies that are spoken of here, that God will make all those enemies his footstool. He will put his feet on things like grief and things like shame and to put his feet on them to the point where they are humiliated in the presence of the crowd. Jesus came to humiliate those things that humiliate you. So whatever you have been humiliated and bound by and gripped by and, and embraced by and in slavery to are the very enemies. They're your enemies, so the God's enemies. And Jesus said, because of the work that he has done, he is expecting, right? He is expecting his enemies, to be made his footstool. So there is an expectation there, even in what Jesus has within himself. So, the truth is our lives are supposed to be pregnant with hope and expectation that our enemies, those things that destroy us, will be made our footstool, that we can put our foot on those things that destroy us that are our enemies and make them our footstool. I find it interesting how pregnancy and expectation have become interrelated. Why do we say when a, a, a woman is pregnant, she's expecting? That's a strange phrase to use, isn't it? It's true, but why would you link the two, pregnancy and expectation? It's because somehow in the dynamics of these things, pregnancy and expectation are interrelated. Is that because expectation is the developed condition from an implanted seed? Because a woman who is pregnant is now expecting because of an implanted seed. Seed. Without the implanted seed, the woman will never be expecting. So the two are linked together because a woman who is expecting is expecting because of a planted seed. And now she is expecting that planted seed to produce something from her life that will become real, that will be a resurrection, that will be life from the dead, that will be something from nothing, that will come out of the womb, come out of the tomb, just like Jesus came out of the womb of the earth in his resurrection, that woman is going to bring forth a child out of the womb, which is a sign, a symbol in scripture of coming out of the tomb, coming out of the dark place. So expectation is the developed condition from an implanted seed. Therefore, what you expect is the product of the seed you allowed to be planted in you. So I want to do two things here. Number one, what are you expecting? What are you expecting to happen? What are you expecting in life? Because that's the product of the seed that you allowed to be planted in you. How many of you know that when words are spoken to us at times that are, are, are divisive and derogatory and, and demeaning and undermining, that when we receive that seed, we expect to manifest what that person said about us. When a child is told, you'll never amount to anything, some children, that, it's like water off a duck's back. But other children always believe that they will never amount to anything because of the seed that they received makes them expect what the seed was planted to do. Therefore, my expectations are governed by the seed 
that I receive. And I can choose the seed that I receive. Therefore, I can manage my expectations by determining the seed that I will receive because that will fix the expectation. Is that clear? Now, I'm going to take a little diversion here and then come back to this. There are three notable, notable observations regarding the early church which are very significant in how the expression of Christian doctrine has developed away from them. Number one, the absence in the earliest creeds of any mention of conscious eternal torment being the punishment of non-believers. Now we might, we might chew a little more on some of this stuff on, on Wednesday night by just dropping it into your... So in the earliest creeds of Christianity, there is not one single mention of conscious eternal torment being the punishment of non-believers. That's interesting, and it's scary to think how now we have become dominated by that subject matter as the core of the gospel. Number two, the preeminent image of God as Father. That has been... Lost. That is, we have developed away from that. You understand the word preeminent? It means before, the foremost. The foremost image of God as Father has ceased to be where it needs to be in the mind of the church and in the message of Christianity. Let me read you this that I, this is a quote. The talismanic word, you know what a, talis, a talisman is like, it's like a medley, something you wear that, that shows off your belief. The talismanic word of the Alexandrian fathers, which is, this is the early church in the first, second through to the third century, Alexandria, which is Egypt. As of the New Testament, sorry, the talismanic word of the Alexandrian fathers, as of the New Testament was father. That was the most important word to them. This word has now unlocked all mysteries, solved all problems, and explained all the enigmas of time and eternity. That's quite a claim. But why do you think Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. My Father. He was always talking about the Father. Because when you get a grasp on that... This is the revelation you have. It unlocks all mysteries, solves all problems, explains all the enigmas of time and eternity. For centuries in Christendom, after the Alexandrian form of Christianity had waned, the fatherhood of God was a lost truth. And most of the worst errors of the modern creeds are due to that single fact more than all other causes. That's why for me, some of the critical parts of scripture are the ones about fathers. For example, the story that we have because we have drifted from the importance of father called the prodigal son when actually it is not a story about a son and it's not interested in prodigal. What it's interested in is the attitude and heart of a father who doesn't even take a prayer of repentance in order to give his forgiveness to the son but he's always looking for the son. It's the father looking for the son, not the son looking for the father. And there is a reuniting there. So, so this image of father is critical. Now again, we, I'm not here to talk about that. You'll see why I'm mentioning these things because it leads us on a journey to talk about the seed because the seed is what we become expectant with. Okay. So this is the third one that we have moved away from. The resurrection not the crucifixion as the central theme. I read this quote, which was wonderful. It took Jesus a thousand years to die. And the reason this person said that was this. Images of his corpse did not appear in the churches until the 10th century. So the person says it took Jesus a thousand years to die. It's a bit tongue-in-cheek, but what it's saying is you will find no expression in art of the death of Jesus until the 10th century. 1,000 years after his death was when you begin to see art forms depicting his crucifixion. Those are the provocative opening sentences of this book called Saving Paradise, 
how Christianity traded love of this world for crucifixion and empire. That's a conversation in its own right. We may, again, talk about the three aspects of church, empire, corporate, and organic, on Wednesday night. Uh, empire was the dominant force in the early church from about the second century on. It was about building an empire. And so one cannot doubt, and I don't dismiss this because there are beautiful people involved, but the Catholic Church became an empire. The Holy Roman Empire, right, was not Italy and Caesar. The Holy Roman Empire was there because they were saying there was the Roman Empire, but now we have the Holy Roman Empire over which the Pope rules. And it was a dreadful state of affairs. It did not represent the kingdom of God and of his Christ. Now, having said that, I have great respect for Pope Francis. I think he says some beautiful things. This week, he he said in in this thing that I've just produced, he said that communion is not the food of the perfect, but it's the medicine of 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 the weak. Communion is not the food of the perfect, It's the medicine of the week. That's a beautiful revelation. So, here's the deal then. So, so that became empire. Of course, what we've replaced that with is a modern version, which is corporate. So, we've made the church corporate. Now, we'll talk a bit maybe on Wednesday about that, when actually organic is the goal, and that's something we'll talk about. Um, So... uh, Saving Paradise turns up, this is the book, turns upside down the history of the church's view of Jesus' crucifixion and its stress on the importance of suffering. The authors attempt to show that for the first thousand years of its existence, the Christian church placed much more emphasis on the resurrection than the crucifixion. Now this is historically true, okay? But of course what happened is... Catholicism drifted into the incarnation. So your most prominent thing you're going to see in Catholic churches is Mary and baby Jesus, the incarnation, okay? And that's where all the stuff comes from then of an attempt to deal with things and Mary, Queen of Heaven and all this, you know, kind of confusing stuff. Whereas the Protestants of which we are part would be termed part of that particularly since the reformation in the 1500s we then made the emphasis on 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 crucifixion so the catholics drift to incarnation we drift to crucifixion when the reality was at the core was resurrection okay now, again, we may talk Wednesday night. I'm trying to draw you in on Wednesday night. Why we grabbed on crucifixion in the Protestant world and why the Catholic Church grabbed onto incarnation. And most of them were to do with power and control and manipulation. Because the resurrection sets people free. The resurrection is not you have to suffer and death. The resurrection is death is done. The grave is empty. He has risen, there is life for all. It brings a very different emphasis to the message. So, for the first three centuries, the Christians, listen to this, were known for their joy. The symbols of the catacombs, you know what the catacombs are? The catacombs were the the underground burial chambers outside of Rome, which go on for mile after mile, of the early Christians, particularly the, obviously the Christians who were in and around Rome and the Roman church, um, because at first it was illegal until, until Constantine, um, they were buried underground. They, they, they had a whole system of ceremony and respect and they were buried underground in what would have been a Christian burial for them. So that's the catacombs. The symbols of the catacombs, that's the stuff written in there on the tombs, like every other indication of early teaching, show the glad, bright, loving character of the Christian faith. It was a religion of joy and not of gloom, of life and not of death, of tenderness, not of severity. Now guess what happened when we shifted from resurrection? It becomes a religion that's more about gloom than joy, death than life, severity rather than tenderness. We find in the catacombs neither the cross of the 5th and 6th centuries, nor the crucifixes of the 12th centuries. This is telling you when all these came in. 
not the cypresses and death's heads of the 18th. Instead of those symbols of beauty, instead of these, the symbols of beauty, hope, and peace. The earliest inscription of a Latin cross in the catacombs of Rome is on the tomb of the Empress Gala Placidia. You're learning some stuff here. In AD 451. No picture of the crucifixion until the 9th century. No portable crucifix till long after. So you don't see a Latin cross until AD 451. And you get no picture of the crucifixion until the 9th or 10th century. And no portable crucifix, you know, we wear crosses, until long after that. That's because at the core of their message was the resurrection. And by that they believed life now. It wasn't resurrection because this world is horrible and when we leave this world, thank God there's a resurrection so we'll all go to heaven. They believed the resurrection was now. So yes, there was a hope beyond the grave. Yes, there would be, at the last time, an opening of all the graves and the dead will be raised, okay? But the resurrection they believed in was a resurrection that affected them now. Hence the joy and not the gloom and the excitement of life. It was about life now. It was about the power of life dominant over death. That was their message. Life conquers death and in him is life. So in him you conquer death now. Now what did they mean by, did they mean they would never physically die? No, they meant that they were expecting their enemies to be made their footstool. They were expecting the challenges, the difficulties, the conflicts to be made their footstool. Now they didn't always know how that would work out or how that would move forward in the midst of adversity, but they knew that it would because Jesus conquered the grave. When he went into the darkness of the tomb, he knew nothing other than what his father had promised him. But he had to face the darkness of the tomb, but on the third day he rose again. Have you ever wondered why the church moved in its early times and met on the first day of the week? Why did the church meet on the first day of the week? Because the first day of the week, which was their Sunday, was Resurrection Day. Now, if the cross was what was important, why didn't they meet on Friday? They were not following Jewish traditions, so now the Sabbath, the Saturday, in the old Jewish thing, that was the point of being finished. But if the cross was the all-important issue, they would have said, we must meet on Friday. But they said, no, we meet early in the morning on Sunday because we are celebrating the resurrection, life from the dead. It was a joyful gathering that says life now. Jesus conquered the grave and death is conquered in us and we expect our enemies, not people, because they were known to be loving. But the shame, the guilt, the, the, all the stuff that goes on, the wounds, the hurts, the disappointments to be made our footstool because he is risen. It was all their enemies becoming their footstool. God's kingdom showing up here, showing up now, changing the way things are. It's been said that the church did not create the resurrection story, but the resurrection story created the church. See, some people accuse and say, oh, the church just created the resurrection story. But there would be no church without the resurrection. It's not that the church created the resurrection story. It's that the resurrection story created the church. So can you see how we have moved and departed away from what was at the core of our belief? And so we have changed the face of what people see as our religion. And we need to come back to the central theme that it was resurrection that was important. It was the love of the Father that we were coming into. And in the love of the Father, we were also going to find the ability to say that conscious eternal torment may not be what we said it was. So how does all this connect to expectations? Well, Peter wanted Jesus to manage his expectations regarding resurrection. Matthew 16, verse 21 through 23. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, 
So for many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must kill, but on the third day be raised to life. And Peter took him to aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. The reason he said that is because he did not believe in the resurrection. He thought, if we let them kill Jesus, it's over. Because they did not believe in the resurrection. You see, crucifixions were not uncommon. Now, I understand all the issues of Jesus, you know, the, 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 the sinless man sacrificed for humanity. But crucifixions were not uncommon. Resurrections were. News of another Jew hung on a cross outside Jerusalem, would not make the news. News of an empty tomb spread like wildfire. So the early church's message did not spread because Jesus hung on a cross. It spread because Jesus rose from the dead. The power of the message was not in the cruel torture. The power of the message was this guy conquered death. This guy is alive. This guy makes us alive, and he makes us alive now with a different kind of life, a new kind of life, which is resurrection life. So Peter wanted Jesus to manage his expectations regarding the resurrection. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, I love this, get behind me, Satan, adversary. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. When you have in mind the things of God, you come back to resurrection at the core. And you can't be any more dead than dead. So if you're definitely dead and you rise from the dead, nothing is impossible. So we're nearly done. Jesus' expectations was seeded by the promise of resurrection. Remember we said that a woman is expecting because she has been seeded and it's what she has been seeded with that allows her to say, I am now expecting. So whatever we allow to seed us is what creates our expectation. Jesus had expectations that were seeded by the promise of resurrection. Listen to John chapter 10 verse 18. Jesus said about his life, no one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have the right, the authority, the power to lay it down. But I also have the authority, the power to take it up again. But listen, this command I received from my Father. The seed of promise of resurrection in Jesus was that his Father had spoken to him And given him a command that said, you have the authority to rise again from the dead. His faith was in the word, the seed that the father put within his heart. And he carried that seed into the tomb, expecting to rise again from the dead. Jesus waking up on the the first day of the week, because I believe he rested on the seventh day. Opening his eyes in the tomb was not a surprise to Jesus. It had been a surprise to us, but it was no surprise to him. Why? He was expecting to rise from the dead. Why? Because he had been seeded. He had chosen what he would be seeded with. What he would be seeded with was what his father had said to them, this is not the end. The grave cannot hold you. Death cannot keep you. Trust me, this is not the end. It really is finished. You really have committed your spirit into my hands. So Jesus was expecting because he had been seeded by this word. The seed to which we open up for its implantation deep within our spirit must be the truth of resurrection of Christ from the dead. And with him, therefore, us also. If you will allow that seed to be implanted deep within your spirit, your expectations will be governed by the presence of the resurrected Christ deep within your spirit. And if he was raised, we are raised with him also. That's what the Bible says. We raise with him. He lives, we live also because of him. That is the seed which will cause us to be expecting the best of heaven to show up 
in our lives. I'm very clean to move the expectation of everyone in this house from the distorted perspectives of either the Catholics that took us to the Incarnation or the Protestants of which I am in essence one that have taken us to the crucifixion and bring our expectation back to the resurrection, life from the dead. The coming out of the tomb, life coming into dead things, things changing for us. So my last verse, Romans 10 verse 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, which is the equivalent of saying love wins, right? Christus Victor, he has conquered, it is finished. And listen, and believe in your heart, what? Not that he's the son of God, but believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, this is a different perspective on what salvation is because the question would be saved into or saved from. See, I think this verse is telling us that you can be saved into, into what? Into the resurrection life that is at the core of the message of God to the world. Okay, first thing that it says about Jesus, when John talks about him in John chapter 1, it says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Not that death... That life was the light of men. So when he breaks out of the tomb, that life is the light of men. And he says, and he is the light who lights every man who comes into the world. You see, you are not being lit by a judgment condemnation that that light shows your blackness, your sin, your unworthiness, your filth. You have been given the light of resurrection, which shows you the tomb is empty, the stone is rolled away, and all that's left is for you to be willing to walk out because resurrection is your promise. You believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus really did did it, he won, it's finished, death is done, the grave is conquered, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved because that is the seed from which your expectation will come. I expect to be blessed, I expect to be a blessing, I expect to prosper, I expect to prosper others, I expect to be joyful, I expect to be a joy to others. And that is true for every one of us because in this place and in that revelation of resurrection seeded by that truth, all your enemies become your footstool. Now it says he was expecting all his enemies. So the expectation precedes the actual reality, but the actual reality comes because of the expectation. So he is expecting all his enemies to become his footstool. I want you to go out of here tonight expecting all your enemies to become your footstool. That instead you being under the foot of depression, depression is under your foot. Instead of you being under the foot of condemnation, condemnation is under your foot. Instead of you being under the foot of disillusionment, disillusionment is under your foot. All your enemies becoming your footstool is the promise of resurrection. Get past the cross. What Jesus did worked. Whether you understand it or not, he said, it is finished. Don't worry, it worked. But if you believe because of that, that he really is Lord, he's calling the shots, he has the power to call the shots, and you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead. This is the core. It's resurrection. It's life flowing from there into me, the same life, the same resurrection. Then I guarantee all your enemies, you can expect to become your footstool. And just maybe we can become those first century Christians who were known for their joy, their tenderness, and their peace. Let's pray. Father, we bless you for calling us into your kingdom. If there's anyone here tonight that's rung a bell with you, I just want you to open your heart and just say, Lord, please seed me. Seed me with the wonder of resurrection. I want to believe in my heart fully, totally in the deepest place that you raised Jesus from the dead, not just as a symbol of the Christian church, but as an actual reality through time and eternity that death does not win, my enemies do not conquer me, but I find freedom and life in you. True salvation 
is resurrection life. That's true salvation. True salvation is resurrection life. I pray it will burst out of your spirit. I pray that it will shatter everything around you, that you'll know it, feel it, walk in it, live in it, love in it in the same way that you are loved. And as you do that, the Father will come back to what the Father is supposed to be. He'll find his place in your heart. He'll find his place in your life. And everything else will begin to come into its proper order. Because we are not religious people in a new religion. We are followers of Jesus, just like those first followers who Jesus says, if you follow me, like Chris said, I will make you the right kind of fishers. So thank you, Father. Help us, bless us tonight as we go. Let our spirits be lifted and let resurrection burst out of our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others. <laughs>